for about close to 23 hours now. We have been looking at the problems for the news industry. And we have also been inspired by a lot of great colleagues around the world who are doing great stuff, trying to reconnect with audiences and rethink and change their mindset. And we have also heard that it's not really easy to do that. So now, wrapping up these 24 hours, we try to look at some industries that might be able to inspire us. We just heard from the art director at the, one of the biggest art museums and most successful art museums in Northern Europe, Aras, right here in Aarhus. And they do something different. They don't ask the customers what they want, because if they do, they will just say, we want an exhibition from painters we know already, uh, like Picasso or Monet or Monk. Um, but they say, our job is something different. Our job is to give people something that they don't know that they will end up loving. That's a mind shift change, and they are successful with that. Let's now turn to some other companies that has really been able to rethink their own identity and the way they are thinking about themselves and the role they do, to do good for society and also for their own bottom line. And first, I would like to welcome uh, the guy who, uh, in 2008, working for the Danish oil and gas company, nationally owned, uh, basically producing oil and gas, polluting the air and the world, um, went up to his CEO and said, hey, buddy, I think we need to change. So welcome, Jacob Asko Bus. Uh, you work at the company which is now called Öster. Um, welcome here. Um, and you're behind a screen with a lot of uh, what? It doesn't look like uh, coal and oil and gas, but uh, windmills. What was your idea? What were you thinking back in 2008 working for Danish oil and gas? Well, back, back in those days, we were seeing some early trends that the future of, of energy could be changing. We were seeing a number of, of scientific reports come out. Uh, Al Gore's uh, movie, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, Lord Stern's uh, report on the economics of climate change, and the IPCC's report that came out in 2007 saying that it was quite clear, more than 90% probability that climate change was man-made. And uh, all of these trends we were seeing sort of pointed to the fact that long-term, it would not be sustainable for the world to produce energy through fossil fuels. And, and, and those, we, we were beginning to have those discussions in the company and, and, and we sort of came to the conclusion that if we wanted to be at the forefront of the energy industry, we needed to set a long-term vision of transforming ourselves from, from black to green energy. Change the name to Öster uh, and you change the mindset and uh, fast forward to today. Um, could you explain us how big Öster is now? It is actually the second biggest company in Denmark, right? Only exceeded by Novo Nordisk selling insulin. Yeah, so, so we are the second largest uh, company in Denmark when you measure on, uh, on market value. Uh, and we are the fifth largest renewable energy company in the world. And that has been quite a transformation because 10 years ago, we were emitting one third of all day CO2 and our core business was in fossil fuels. Uh, back in, in 2007, only 7% of our earnings came from renewable energy. So it has been a massive transformation of, of the company. We were named the most sustainable company in the world earlier this year. So, so obviously we, we've taken a massive uh, and, and significant change of the company over the past decade because we wanted to position ourselves for a future that looked very different from, from the past we came from. And, and right now, looking back on it, it, it seems like that was a logical decision, and uh, of course you should do it, and everybody could see that. But the case was, uh, not many people could see that. A lot of oil companies in, in the world right now, um, they didn't take that decision. They didn't see that. They didn't dare changing their core uh, product, or their values, or their identity, or their mindset. Um, so how has that, what has that done to a lot of these energy companies? Well, I think a lot of energy companies are starting to see that this is the new reality 
and that they are starting to set ambitions to, to transform. I think our advantage has been that we started this journey 10, 12 years ago, which means that today we are the world leader in offshore wind. Uh, we are the company by far that has built the most offshore wind capacity all over the world. So, so I think by sort of taking a look into the future and projecting yourself not to where reality is going to be in six or 12 months, but maybe where it's going to be in 10 or 20 years and saying, okay, how can I sort of align myself with that future and start creating it? Uh, ideally, before everybody else starts doing the same, that, that, that really enables you to, to get ahead. A lot of energy in that story also for us. If you, if you, I mean, you're a news consumer yourself, and if you look at us from the outside, um, Jacob, what do you see? Well, I see that we live in a world that's, that's characterized by information overload to an extent we've never seen before. And, and when I then look to what are the solutions, I don't really find any good solutions. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, who, who will help me sort of create an overview of what is actually happening in the world? I, I just don't see those products out there. They are clearly uh, very, very good news media uh, doing great jobs, but, but I think there is some more innovation to be done here, helping to, yeah, navigate this, uh, this information overload that, that we are in the middle of, and, and it's just getting worse and worse. So, so with your experience, I mean, if you can, if somewhere in a newsroom can see what we do is maybe not sustainable for in the next five, 10 years, maybe we need to, to think uh, differently and do something different and not do the same as everybody else um, with the price going to the ground. Uh, what would your advice be to those people? Uh, what was your experience doing that? Well, I think a lot of, 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 of successful innovation happens when you go out and actually look at what it, what it is the customers need and, and, and don't necessarily ask them what they want because, or, or at, at least add something to that. But, but I think what you shouldn't do is sort of start to tinker on the margins and say, okay, we did it like this, we'll do it slightly differently. And then we, we've sort of uh, reinvented our, our product. I think you sort of need to start from what, what is it that people will need to navigate this, uh, uh, this information overload. And I mean, news media serve many different uh, purposes. I mean, that we need to stay updated. We need to get smarter. We need to sort of, navigate the whole world of, of identities and so forth. So there are so many different purposes. And I think you sort of need to go back and, and really sort of reinvent yourself around those different purposes because people want these different things, but they probably want them at different times. I mean, there's a difference between what I read over the weekend and what I read during the week, for example. So, so your point is, if you had gone out on the streets in, in Denmark and asked people, Hey, wouldn't it be fair if you threw out your 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 oil polluting uh, central heating system and instead uh, got your power from and, and heating from from windmills? Um, what would they have answered in, back in two thousand and eight? The consumers. They would have said, "Are you crazy? Those things that you see in the background here—they're three, four, five times more expensive than the way we produce energy from coal and natural gas." So that will be way out in the future. So, so, so really uh, take that thought out of your mind uh, uh, because that's, that's not really cost competitive. And, and I think that's, that's the truth of many innovations. I mean, if, if it's an obvious alternative right now, then it's probably not a big enough innovation. Uh, the challenge then is of course to say, okay, if it is radically different from what we're doing today, what do we then need to do to realize that idea, that concept? Uh, that's, that's what we did in offshore wind. Uh, over the past six, seven years, we reduced the cost by, by 65, 70% on, on this product. And today it is cost competitive. It is cheaper to pr produce green electricity from offshore wind than from coal and gas fired power plants. It, Jacob, it sounds very easy, but take us inside Danish oil and gas in 2008, 9, 10, 
and and give us a picture about I mean when you when the CEO went out and tell, told the staff now we are doing this major transition we are throwing out everything we did even our name and we'll do something completely different was everybody applauding saying that's great you are heading for the future buddies or what happened well not initially but 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 we, 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 we sort of put out the analysis and shared the analysis saying this is where we believe the world is going long term. We didn't say this is going to happen in six to 12 months, uh, but, but we put out a, what we believe was a fairly powerful sort of analysis of where we saw, saw, saw the long term trend going. And then we said in 2040, we want to have 85% green and uh, as opposed to uh, today where it's 85% black. Uh, and, and just setting the direction without sort of saying that that, that will have to happen in, uh, in, in, in six months from now. I think that that, that sort of starts to align people behind a, a vision. And then you start working towards it. And today we are at more than 90% uh, green energy uh, in, in our portfolio. So we are today where we wanted to be back then in 2040. So I think it also shows that if you sort of set the right direction and then you really start working towards it, then things will accelerate uh, if, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you also, I mean, we, we've also been part of a, a mega trend, you could say, in society around green energy. So we've also been lucky. But, but what I want you to talk about is culture change inside your organization. And, and, and if you are completely honest and you could be here, it's only us and a few hundred thousand people uh, watching here. What, I mean, what did people say? What was the reaction? I mean, do, uh, everybody wants progress, but nobody wants change. Is that right? Yeah, and I think a, a pretty practical approach is to start establishing sort of the department of new things. I mean, we established a renewable energy division and then they started working on it. And what we said over time, we allocated more and more of our capital to that area and we stopped funding some of the uh, existing areas. So it's, it's also a question of sort of boosting the ones who are developing the products for the future. And, and then saying to the ones who are struggling, I mean, that, that was the, the fact of, of the fossil fuel business, it was struggling. So, so that was a lot of restructuring, a lot of, of, of cost reduction, a lot of, of reducing the investments uh, in, in, in those areas. So it, the culture change happened sort of as a portfolio transformation. Uh, the, the new parts grow and the old parts sort of uh, yeah, shrink. And, and, and at some point, the new parts are the company culture. I mean, we didn't change the name uh, back then. We changed the name in 2017 when we had more or less completed the transformation and when, it, when the majority of the company was on the green side. And, and to be fair, it's, we, we should also mention your owners, which is the, the Danish government, the, the state of, of Denmark. Um, and and uh, it would also be fair to say that that transformation was not without its controversy, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we came to a point in 2012 where, where we came into some very significant financial issues. Basically, we had too much debt relative to our earnings, so our capital structure went, went pretty sour, and that's sort of when the banks and the rating agencies start calling you and say, you, you better rebalance your, your earnings and your debt because otherwise uh, we, we will basically uh, yeah, do some, some not so nice things to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and that led to a, a very famous capital injection in Denmark where, where Goldman Sachs came in with, with and, and bought 18% of the company. And, and that was absolutely needed to get fresh equity into the company in order to continue our transformation. Uh, and, and really had the capital to develop uh, all the offshore wind farms that, that you see behind me here. And that, um, that almost... But it took, I would say, three, four years of, of really sort of a lot of public debate around was this a good idea or not? And I think today it's, it's been settled. It was a good idea. It really was one of the key things that helped the company uh, it, on this critical transformation path. But it almost killed the, the former social democratic uh, uh, or left-wing government in, uh, in Denmark. Um, here at the, at the very end, try to repeat if, 
one single advice to a publisher or editor-in-chief in the newsroom looking in the horizon and say, this is not going the right direction. And having this idea on changing, but being doubtful whether the owners or uh, the, the newsroom culture uh, will be able to do it. What would, would be your single advice be to, to these people around the world? I'll go out and I'll find 10 best trends about where this industry is going. And then I'll take those and I'll say, okay, what does that mean that we have to deliver in the future? And then I will go to my board and say, this is what I believe is, is sort of uh, the, the future product that, that we need to deliver. Uh, if we can agree on that, then let's start, start getting constructive about how we could create it. Uh, I think that's, that's how you how you sort of yeah, change your future. Jacob Askobus from Ørsted, thank you very much. And let us uh, take the next example. It is from something very different from uh, the news industry, meaning the fashion industry. Um, it is, uh, in, also in Denmark, we have some of the biggest uh, fashion companies in the world. Scandinavia is well famous for it. Um, but we also know that the fashion industry around the world is one of the most polluting industries. Producing these fast fashion is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is not, uh, yes, it might be easy, but it is, it is also uh, not always uh, doing good to, to the, the environment uh, doing it. And uh, you're dealing with that, and you've done that for many years, Eva Kose. Um, you're from the Global uh, Fashion Institute in Copenhagen, and you, um, you have actually, you have spotted this trend that uh, fashion needs to, to, to change. Why? Funny that you call it a trend, um, but, but yeah, I mean, to, to zoom out, fashion globally is one of the world's largest industries. It's a huge driver for economic development and growth and job creation. That's all on the positive side, right? But to your point as well, it's also one of the world's most resource intensive because it's not only about pollution. Um, fashion is accountable for 4% of all of the world's CO2 emissions. We're accountable for 20% of wastewater, um, industrial wastewater in the world. 22.5% of all pesticides used are used in fashion production. And that's because we sometimes forget that fashion is actually very closely linked to agriculture. So we're growing cotton, we're cutting down forests. We, we use so much land and natural resources to come to where we are right now in producing what is way too much fashion than, and clothes than what the planet needs. If we look at the growth trajectory that the fashion industry was on, and our latest surveys, I have to put a disclaimer out, say they, they came from 2019. So obviously the curve has broken a little bit during COVID, but the growth trajectory that the industry was on was gonna lead us to a growth of 81% in volume towards 2030. And knowing that if we respect what scientists call planetary boundaries, we're already at a stage where we're exceeding what the planet has in its budget in terms of natural resources. We cannot not absorb more CO2. We don't have more land or water or capability to, to take chemicals and pesticides. So it simply is not a feasible model going forward that we would grow 81% regardless of a small break on that curve. So we need to find new ways of setting up our business model. So a little bit, you know, building on what Jacob said, you know, this is about creating a resilient future business model. So this is not um, a philanthropic quest about doing good. This is actually, if business leaders are embarking on this journey, they do it because it's good for business. Because if you are going to have a business in the future where we are going to have to see higher prices on water, higher prices on any type of use of natural resources and so on, um, this definitely, you, you, you need to sort of steer your business in a different way. And that's what we could see back in 2000, same, same years actually. So in 2006, when Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth came out and it sort of arose to a more common knowledge that this is what we're talking about. Fashion, sorry, not in, but climate is, is something that we all have to relate to. And then eventually other, you know, different things occurred. But at the moment, the fashion industry was not talking about sustainability. We knew that we had issues in the supply chain of 
child labor and exploitation, which is still big, big problems with fashion, not only the environmental, also the social. Um, and then the UN Climate Summit came to Copenhagen in 2009. And that's when we set up the first Copenhagen Fashion Summit, which was sort of the first um, international gathering of industry leaders across um, the world to discuss, you know, how do we do this going forward? And that has sort of picked up pace. And now it's one of the biggest topics for our industry going forward. And let's, let's stay at the, the, the problem first in, in order to, mm -hmm. to see that. I mean, when I was a little boy, uh, ah, that's a long time ago. But not so long ago, um, the, the fashion, the, the, if you went to an, into a fashion store, they might have a spring sale or they had spring collection and they had autumn collection. And that was that was about it. Um, talk us through what in, if you look at Sarah or you look at uh, H&M or they, is it true they have maybe eight, 10, 12 times a year, they change completely their collection, right? That's called fast fashion. Is that so? Well, yes and no. I mean, there are some that actually push new collections out 52 times a year. That doesn't mean that they change everything that they have in store, but that there is always new deliverables and new, you know, new collections for people to, to come in and purchase um, every week. And obviously that pace has somewhat also scrutinized the old system in our industry when we, to your point, when I was a kid as well, in January, we had the, the sales of, you know, the winter clothes that the stores had to get rid of. And in August, you would have sort of the summer sales. Nowadays, and this is mainly pressured by online retail, there's sales every other moment, right? So there's mid-season sales and whatever sale moment because people are pressuring the market down. And I think this is a big part of, what has created an issue in our industry. The fact that it's still a good business model to overproduce and mark down your product, which has you know, developed an attitude from, from us as consumers to fashion being a commodity that we just take, use a little bit and then throw away. So it's become waste, wasteful. And I think this is one of the big issues that we have with our industry generally is that the prices have become so low that we don't value product anymore. I also think that when you and I grew up, Ulrich, we, we bought less and we cherished it longer. And, you know, our grandparents were repairing things and, you know, people had a different relationship to what they bought too. And, and this is definitely something that is, that is scrutinized by the markdowns, but also, of course, fashion chains that are putting really cheap product out. And, and allowing us to buy way, way more than we need. So in Europe, we buy 60% more clothes than we did 15 years ago, 60. And, what, and we what use happened, it maybe what, half the time. Eva, what happened in the, when, when the store take in a new collection and they have marked down the old one, but they couldn't sell the, uh, all of it? What happens to a lot of these clothes that is not bought by consumers? Well, a lot of it ends on different types of outlets or are being marked down you know, again and again, um, and very little is actually being collected and put into recycling. Um, some of it is incinerated or in other ways ending in landfill. So about 72% of uh, all clothes end in landfill and they end in what we call mixed household, um, you know, waste. And that means that it won't get recycled. And there's and a lot of burned. potential. Isn't it true that it, it, it also get burned? Some of it gets incinerated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Some clothes, so, but that, that's also, uh, you know, in Denmark, we have a lot of um, efficient energy use of incinerating um, waste. And, and um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's a common thing. It, it, it sounds dreadful. It's a little bit like when we saw trucks of tomatoes sort of just also just being dumped because the supermarkets wanted to keep the prices up and so on. So obviously this feels appalling to people that, you know, perfectly good goods that are, you know, could be used by somebody um, are being incinerated. So, so we're talking about an industry, which not all of it, but it, we're talking broad terms, focus mm -hmm. on speed and produce as much as possible at the lowest price. Would that be fair to say? That has been the trend for a long time. Yeah. Which industry could you mention where that is also the case? This is a leading journalistic question. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of industries, unfortunately. I think we live in a consumerism world and in a world of, uh, of abundance where, where, where there's simply a, ten, a tendency 
for us to want more and more and more. And I think we've just passed the Black Friday, which I think is some, something that the devil created. Um, this is markdowns on perfectly good product that should have a price because externalities should be taken into the cost of a, of a product. So what has this cost the world? I mean, not least the hands that created whatever product it may be, but all of the externalities, the river that didn't send the invoice, the forest that was never paid, you know, what, what about all of that into to product and price? And I think we've come to a stage where we're pushing prices to too low a point that makes us buy three rand rather than one and have an overproduction, you know, both overproduction, but also overconsumption attitude. And that goes across many industries and fashion industry is definitely one of the ones that are, you know, encouraging pushing that as well. Because fashion at the end of the day is an emotional choice, right? It's not really a rational choice. You know, we buy food because we wanna, you know, because we're hungry and we buy maybe ecological or organic food because we wanna give our kids things that are with less pesticides. But if you buy clothes, I mean, apart from if you're cold um, or, or warm, you know, you, you buy clothes because you wanna look good or feel good. And you're going out on Saturday when we did that back in the days. And, uh, or, or yeah, so it has a different set of, 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 uh, of rules behind it. And, and fashion has therefore been creating needs, right? The need for purple, the need for a new length, the need for a new waistline or whatever. So it's not a rational choice. Um, but I, I think that fashion can become a really exciting enabler in terms of educating and enforcing people to think about what they purchase. Because fashion is also, like media, part of setting the mood and the trend of things. Mm. So what we talk about, who's hot, what's not, you know, Fashion influences a lot of other cultures um, and cultural disciplines, you could say. So, so therefore, I think fashion is a really strong communication tool. What, what, if, if you have a fashion company today and, uh, and, and, and you look at this, uh, what, what will drive your desire to change your mindset for this? I mean, what's the, what's the key driver for it? Is that it's the consumer or is because you, can, you are worried about the, the, the planet? Well, I, I, I think, unfortunately, I wish it was consumer driven demand, um, but unfortunately that that's not what we're seeing. So even though, and during COVID, we've seen a rise in consumers' interests towards more sustainable products and caring more, I think mostly driven by fear because we're afraid of the future. We know climate crisis is you know, right on the next brick and, and being in a, in a global pandemic obviously also raises fear generally but it doesn't really show in people's behavior. Um, so people still purchase really crap product and go for the cheapest bargain. Um, so I think fashion has to change on its own. It has to change because it decides to. And obviously there we need bold leadership and a little bit like what Asta has done in that transition, it shows that what created that change was not a consumer demand, but a, a decision taken by leadership who drives that through. I think right now and over the last 10 years, we've been able to, in the fashion context, to prove the business case. And I think this is critical, that this is not a philanthropic quest. You can do well and do good at the same time. And, and actually we can prove that companies that has been the most resilient also in the COVID crisis are the ones that has the most control over the supply chain, the least fragmented supply chain, the, the closest relationship with their suppliers and those who are most effective that has the minimum sort of overuse and in, in overproduction. Otherwise you sit with huge inventory you can't get rid of. Those who are optimizing on water usage, chemical uses, energy uses and whatnot. So I think the business model is pretty clear. And those companies who are changing their behavior and their business model right now are the ones that we're gonna see survive over the next 10 years. The others will not be able to survive. The prices on all of the externalities are going to be, or, and all of the natural resources are going to be too high. If, it, if it's so obvious to, to do this, um, why is it then so difficult? Well, I think it depends on, again, leadership. So do you have short-term incentives or long-term lens, right? So are you looking at how do we survive the next quarter or how can I come out um, at the end of this year with with good numbers and my shareholders are gonna be happy? Or do you have the long-term lens where you think 10 to 20 years ahead? Um, and I, th I think that's simply what differentiates people's um, mindset.
And I, I do think also that, of course, there are some that, um, that maybe don't feel they have the investment um, ready needed to, to put behind this, because of course it, it, checks, it takes something, it costs something. I'm sure that Jacob could speak to that as well. In Erster's case, you know, it, it isn't an easy turnaround, right? It looks beautiful when you look back at it, but it, it, it's a big cultural shift, but it's also it takes a lot of investment and maybe shifting out people and, and suppliers and, and ways of doing things that you've done traditionally. You're a citizen. You're a news consumer. Uh, tell us what you see when you look at our profession. In terms of... On the, our incentive structures, uh, what do you see? Well, I, I agree with, with Jacob on the fact that we live in an information overload, and I think Good, good journalism is about helping us decipher that and, 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 and bring out the good stories and, and the true stories as well. Um, and since now that everybody has become their own media on social media and have multiple channels that are not necessarily educated or informed, um, but more personal, um, is uh, interesting. It's an interesting era, but it's also somewhat scary. Um, that so much is floating around that isn't validated or checked. I think, I mean, when we look at co the coverage that media does generally on sustainability and fashion, we see a trend in towards sort of creating headlines that has a lot of clickbait. And, um, and I think, yeah, that, that sometimes minimizes the information level, it's more about, you know, pulling the pants down on people or, you know, showing the greenwashing stories and, and not helping provide the positive stories about what innovations and what the solutions are and, and the good cases. And um, so we actually organize something called media masterclasses where we invite media to join some masterclasses and educate journalists and reporters on how to understand the complexity of sustainability in fashion. So what is circularity about? Who's implicated? What system shifts are we looking at? What does biodiversity and fashion mean? And, and you know, to understand the depth of it, because we think that the more informed journalists are, the better reporting they give. Eva, you just got a new job. Congratulations with that. Will you tell us what it is? You're moving to London. Yeah, yeah I am. Eventually, I'm joining um, a material science and innovation brand called Pangaea that works with the innovative and sustainable solutions for fashion and textile industry, and also showcases how, how to do an actual sustainable fashion brand. Good luck with that, and thank you for helping yeah. us out here. Thank you very much, Eva. And if you imagine back in the 70s in California and even also in Denmark, some hippies ran around uh, and looked at the way we produced uh, uh, food, and um, they started uh, wobbling about that it might be wrong, that we were not treating the animals right, and maybe we did not good, do good for the earth. And, uh, and um, uh, not many people paid a lot of attention, but laugh of these people. So our ne next guest has been through that journey. I'm not saying he was a hippie, but he was uh, among the first people looking into this new trend of thinking, ah, can we do this differently in food production? So let's welcome uh, Paul Peterson. Uh, Paul, you are the CEO of uh, a very successful ecological, uh, eco, uh, organic uh, dairy company called Tise in the western part of uh, Denmark. And, and welcome here. You even have your, your, your milk bottle uh, behind you. Um, can you take us through what what we're thinking about? Ah, we could produce food in a in a different way back in in the late seventies. How was that? Yeah, I have to admit I have never been a hippie, but uh, I I I like uh, hippies, of course. But uh, I I I'm coming from a traditional uh, uh, family where my father uh, was a, a dairy man, and he has been working in the dairy industry in his whole life. And he was uh, in charge of uh, the factory, uh, dairy factory in Tisa uh, uh, from 1955 until when I bought it in 1992. Um, and we came 
uh, in contact with the hippies, I would say, in 1988, where some of the organic farmers, the first movers uh, of, of organic farmers in Denmark, and they were in the late 70s, where you're referring to, it was not calling organic, it was uh, poisonless, poison-free farming, it was called. But then you, yeah, that's not that's not a good thing to start to, to say that you are when you are living in a commercial agricultural area, that then the neighbors don't like you. So I think uh, it was necessary to, to call them something else, but it was called poisonless farming. So it went out to be uh, ecological farming. And then uh, in the mid of the 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, organic farming was absolutely not a big thing in Denmark, but very few farmers decided leadership decision. We want only to deal with organic farming because we are convinced, we believe that organic farming is the only way to survive for us and our farm. So they take, they took that decision and they took also the decision to say, if this is not going to work, we are going to make, to do something else. We are going out of the agricultural uh, farming uh, business because uh, that they didn't want to live with that if it was organic some of them were hippies they were from Copenhagen terrible people but even and of course friendly people <laughs> they were good people um, yeah. and then there were traditional farmers traditional farmers that could see that what they had done what their farms uh, what their parents had done was not correct so then they took the decision we want to be organic farmers and they asked uh, a lot of dairy companies, don't you want to buy our milk as organic milk and pay us an extra price because you are not producing that much milk if it's produced organic, but it's at least organic, it's uh, produced uh, without pesticides, it's produced without uh, fertilizers, so high uh, degree of animal welfare. That was not something uh, conversion dairy uh, people was, uh, let's say, uh, this was not a, a kick from them, a poison free pesticides that but we also we lived up by that uh, or in, 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 in this part of the area of Denmark. But uh, then they came to my father and uh, uh, they asked him, Mr. Peters, do you want to, uh, could we rent some facilities at your, at your plant because we want to be organic and nobody wants to help us. And my father was uh, close to 70 at that time. And uh, he called me, do you think these organics, uh, organic people, they, they're something for, for us, Paul? And I said, yeah, what the hell? Uh, y y nobody are believing in, an, uh, let's say, in a commercial cheese production uh, plant in, in teas in 1988. The, the big thing in these, these things, that was uh, industrial scale, uh, uh, merging, 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 from 1700 dairy companies until one uh, uh, MD Foods. And uh, where should cheese be in that part? We were going to be killed, we were going to be destroyed. And then, then he said, yes, uh, you are welcome to come here. Then they created their cooperative. Nobody wanted to give them a loan, but they found other. Uh, that was the start of Mercur, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bank. Uh, where they we they loaned they got a loan and it started up, and it was a disaster. Uh, nobody wanted to buy it, but they still uh, their products because it was sold as organic. It was sold as organic whole milk from Tisa and organic uh, fermented milk from Tisa, and they thought we thought that is enough. That was not because it was organic, but that was not. That was not, uh, people don't or didn't want to buy uh, organic milk from Tisa uh, for an extra price of 25% just, be, just because it was organic. Of course not, because uh, as, as uh, my colleague Eva Kruse says that uh, Danes uh, are, are really good to see on price, yeah. on price. So uh, why, why the hell buy, buy for the, a product for 25% more when you can't see the difference? We learned the hard way how to survive as an organic company. And we were helped by, I would say, a commercial farmer here in, in, in selling. He went to our uh, cheese shop where we had a sample of old-fashioned buttermilk. 
And he was absolutely not an organic consumer, I can assure you. He was going into uh, the, 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 um, the tea shop in order to buy some conventional. We were still con producing conventional cheese at that time. And it was good conventional cheese. And my mother asked him, don't you want to taste our buttermilk? And, and it was for free. And then he decided to, to taste it, of course. Um, and then he said the wise words, at least for us, I want to buy that, even that it's organic, because it has a good taste. It was organic, yeah. Even but, if it was organic. But, that but was, all, all, all this, the, the, to fast forward to, to today, just to give people an idea, because it started off as something that was almost being ridiculed. And, and today, would it be fair to say that Denmark is probably the country in the world where most organic products are being sold uh, per capita? Yes. It's a, That's billion, for sure. it's a billion dollar business right now. It's big business, and uh, we are the largest, uh, largest independent uh, organic uh, food company in Denmark. We have a, a turnover more than one billion here from cheese. Uh, we're the biggest company in cheese. That's also the only big, the only company in cheese. But that, that's a, that's today cheese is big business. The organic is big business in Denmark, and why? Because uh, agriculture in Denmark is 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 in fact very. Um, changeable. They are willing to ch change if there's some money in it. Plus, that there has been taken political decisions for for many years that organic farming has to be a part of Danish agriculture. For sure, so, there have been substitutes for that, and then uh, it has gone on. So the, the the situation from from your industry is the same one as in the fashion industry. Uh, the focus for so many years has been to produce as much as possible, as fast as possible, at the lowest price as possible. And then some people come in and change it. And it was not driven by consumer demands. It was driven by, nope. uh, we want to do it differently because we feel it's wrong, right? Yes, that's uh, for sure. Never ask the consumers what they want. Uh, give them what we think they, they, they need tomorrow. So, Paul, if you look at our industry, and I know you do because uh, you watch the news, you listen to the radio, you have an iPhone, um, and, and you read the paper, um, what, what, what do you think we can learn from, from your story about the organic movement? I, I have to, you have to be fast, you have to be efficient, and you have to be price competitive, but please do it in your own speed and only deal with what you uh, feel that is correct to, to do. And do it, uh, then you are sure that what you're doing is, uh, is, is correct. And, uh, and I have just heard the, 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 your, your journalist colleague from Sweden, he said that people, they want to able to be on the job, able to understand, and they want uh, decent information. Go for that, for sure. And, and, and don't go for the fast speed, uh, all these sensations, it's simply too much. You need to decide as a journalist, I don't want to use my life for uh, looking for fast sensations. Of course, find the sensations, but find it when you have done your homework before you are, let's say, publishing it. But but don't don't you if you do something different don't you risk uh, failure and don't you risk being ridiculed by your peers as the first organic farmers was? I once again please if, if... The, the first organic farmers were being ridiculed by doing something different than the rest of it don't you risk being ridiculed and don't you risk failure if you do something different? Yeah, but yes, of course, there's also a risk. But if you you have to begin to love that the wind is something going sometimes going in in your head instead of in in your back, and that's a good sign because uh, then there's not that that many follows if if too much wind uh, from from in in your in your in your face, then you are changing something, and it's nice it's necessary that some somebody are changing something because what we are in and what we have been in 
is not what is sustainable. If, if you if you should give what Paul, if you should give one advice um, to to the news people uh, watching you now, just one advice, what would that be? <laughs> That's really difficult, but but um, um, act fast, slowly, <laughs> but do it slowly. It's really your your the competition is so terrible. Also in the journalist world, I know it. Then you have to ask uh, to work even more fast, but launch it first when it's something that's valuable to be listened on, and it's also correct in a year. That was help us a lot. Paul Peterson, thank you very much for that good yeah. advice. Um, this conference started 23 hours and 35 minutes ago. Um, and one of the first sessions was actually with another industry. It was the CEO of uh, probably the world's most famous restaurant uh, called Noma in, in Copenhagen. And uh, he was talking about uh, going for purpose, about changing an industry that at that time was also focused on speed, amount and price. And then a chef came and did something different and revolutionized not only the elite restaurants, but the food industry. Let's watch it again. Someone who is not really norm a normal guest at journalism uh, uh, conferences uh, around the world, um, a, a man who uh, works for the restaurant business, uh, actually one of the leading uh, restaurants in the world, the Danish restaurant in Copenhagen, Noma, and joining us from our studio in Copenhagen, we hopefully have Ben Lipman sitting there. Ben? Good, mor good morning. <laughs> good morning. You're there. You look good. Um, That's very ben, nice. I've, I've been told I had a face for radio, so you can, uh, you can yeah, say that. And, and I, have, I, have a, I have a face for, yeah, I don't know, a language for ballet. <laughs> um, but but uh, your, your language is better than mine because you're a native Australian. Um, but you live in you live in now in, in Copenhagen. You, you and I, we, for the next 15 minutes, we have the task, which is quite difficult to, to some way make it relevant that a guy from the food industry is talking to journalists, publishers and editors around the world. Um, so Ben, let, let's see if, uh, if we can do that. You are the COO, the Chief Operation Officer uh, at Noma. Um, so let's 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 Try to go back and talk about the food industry uh, back in, let's say, 20 years ago in Copenhagen yeah. and basically around the world. Uh, could you describe that briefly? How did it look like? Well, I mean, as you said, uh, and you can tell by my accent, uh, I'm not in Kansas anymore. So I was in Sydney at that time. But as I'm told by the team here at Noma and the team in Copenhagen, that the restaurant scene was quite similar to other international cities around the world where you really had very strong uh, top tier in dining, predominantly based around French cuisine, heavily influenced by you know, the, the masters of, of French and, and European dining. And then you had this lower tier down the bottom, which was much more driven by price, much more, more, more driven by speed uh, and accessibility. Um, not to say that that one was poor and the in terms of quality and the other was not but you really had those two extremes um and that was similar here as it was in places like london um and and as you say other other places around the world yeah can can i can i do make the journalistic version of what you just said and at sure. back at the time there were basically some elite restaurants which tried to copy uh, french cuisine and then there was a bulk of restaurants basically competing on delivering food to people as cheap as possible, as fast as possible, and as much as possible. Would that be right? That's true. And, That's true. And here's a, another leading journalistic question. If you look mm. around you, do you see any other industry today that looks like that? Of course. Media and journalism, which is why, why, why we're here today. Um, exactly. So... Let, let's talk about um, that in a moment uh, on, 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 on how's that. But yeah. let, let's, let's go back again uh, 20, 18 years ago. There was a Danish chef, an son of an immigrant, 
yeah. who René Redzepi, who uh, started uh, to to rethink uh, the food scene, to rethink the concept of a, of a, a restaurant in in, in Copenhagen. Uh, what was it? What was what was the driving uh, forces, the focus points of that? Yeah, I mean, Rene had travelled the world like many young cooks, young chefs of of his age had done. He had worked under some of the greats in the United States, in France, in Spain, and was coming back to Copenhagen to really start his project, his life's work. Um, and happened upon an opportunity to create a restaurant a couple of kilometers from where where we're sitting today on Copenhagen Harbor um, with with what started at the time with the simple premise of um, cooking the cuisine of Denmark um, and driven by a very singular um, mission, a very singular purpose, the North Star, as he has referred to it, of Noma, uh, which was time and place. Um, which was that wherever you were in the world, um, that you, one should cook, um, drawing upon the produce, the provenance, the storytelling of where they were, and the time, the time of year that they were that they were operating in at that time. Um, and as you say, it was a different time. Um, you know, as we touched upon, you had this very high end, heavily influenced by French and European cuisine. You had this lower end based on price point. Again, I don't want to make that distinction mm -hmm. in terms of quality. But really what you had was this gaping middle. Um, and really over the last 15, 20 years, both within the restaurant itself, but very much outside of it in, in the work that he has been doing, was also set upon trying to reposition the way in which we value food, which again, perhaps is a theme for mm this conference and, and the people gathering today is um, to value where food comes from, to value the people that produce it, to value the people that serve it and create it for you. Um, one, one of the other things that was important to Noma at, at the beginning and something that you and I have touched upon uh, in our conversations together, keep together is this idea around putting constraints around creativity. Mm -hmm. That when, when you put constraints around creativity, and, and in this case, it's, it was this idea of time and place, you force creativity to burst through in unexpected ways. Um, now, what did that mean for Noma? Well, when you are cooking uh, with what the landscape can give you here in Denmark, uh, and if you could see what I, what I walked through this morning, uh, it wasn't sunny, it wasn't warm, it was gray and it was cold, you immediately limit what you can access. Um, things that many other restaurants, many other creators within our industry take for granted. Olive oil, herbs, spices that have become commonplace, citrus, things like that. What that forced was the restaurant to kind of go back to the beginning with a clear sense of purpose, with a clear sense of value and to explore the country, the landscape around them, and that was really the basis of their creativity. So, so you you mentioned a word, purpose. Yes. Um, the the purpose could be, I mean, give people some good food. Isn't that uh, isn't that purpose? Make some money on people being hungry. Yeah. Although I would say, if 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 that was its purpose, if profit was purely its purpose, there are far easier ways to do that, um, both within. The restaurant and hospitality industry or just industries across the board uh you know this is a very labor intensive time intensive industry there there are other ways of doing that um i think what what renee wanted to do and what the team continues to do is create an experience if if all you were looking for was sustenance and to mm. be fed don't come to noma that's a part of it um, the bigger piece is the experience and then the storytelling that that weaves through that. And and the primary way to tell that story is is through what we serve our guests five days a week, most weeks of the year. It's through our sense of service and hospitality, but it's also the storytelling that wraps around that as well. And and fast forward and to, to today and let me, besides the fact that the restaurant is closed down like any other restaurant in, in Copenhagen due to COVID, the situation for Norma is... Uh, probably that is one of the leading uh, Danish brands around the world. 
uh, maybe only exceeded by Lego, Carlsberg, and uh, maybe the royal family. But besides yes. that, could you could you say how big what what has the influence been on this new way of thinking? Has it only affected the elite restaurants for the very rich people? No. Um... I think the influence of Renee and you know the entire team of Noma is is really like a pebble being dropped into a into a lake. You know the ripple effect is enormous, both immediate, uh, uh, d delayed impact, but also direct and indirect. Um, as you say, he and many of the restaurants that that you know came up around that time and were inspired by the work of Noma, uh, including by former chefs who had 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 worked alongside Renee in the kitchen helped put the Danish dining scene and hospitality scene on the map and helped establish that scene as a key reason why people come to Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the statistics that, that the industry shared earlier in this year, but I think it was you know anywhere between 10 and 15% of all people who visit Denmark mm -hmm. come primarily for a, some type of dining and culinary experience. So, so, um, so the front page version of what you just said is that it was not only affecting the lead, it has, it has piled down, it has changed the focus of the whole food restaurant business. I mean, even the burgers at McDonald's are, have improved in quality. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yes, I, it may be a leap on our behalf to take credit for that. You know, I'm sure there are, there are other factors and considerations that have driven that. But I think to your point, um, you know, Noma has been very fortunate to have hundreds and, and hundreds of over the years, probably thousands over the years, uh, it's approaching its 20th anniversary of people that have come from around the world, me included, to work with the restaurant. Um, many of them have left to pursue their own dreams, their own life's work. Um, some of that is in the kitchen, some of it is not, you know, in other adjacent areas, including nonprofits. But even inside the culinary uh, industry, um, they have left to pursue their dreams, perhaps with the same sense of purpose, perhaps with the same values, perhaps with the same mission, but they have applied it in a way that is true to them, whether that be opening a taqueria here in central Copenhagen or going back to the United States and opening a barbecue restaurant. Mm. You know, their, their iteration on the same purpose and the same values is what binds the two together but not in the same kind of everybody who comes and leaves Noma at some point goes on to want to recreate fine dining. No. But Ben, you, you come out basically also from the media world. You, your parents worked in, in the media business. You worked there yourself before entering this uh, industry. Yeah. Uh, so when you see our profession, journalism, the news industry from the outside, what do you see and what can we learn from people from Noma? It, it, it's funny, as you say, um, father was a journalist. Uh, I started my career in the music industry and then moved into television, um, primarily in the television production side, working with the likes of Fremantle Media and, and the Shine Group. Um, and now we as, as Noma are starting to make our foray into that space as well, um, establishing a new company to tell thoughtful, purposeful stories with social impact at their heart. Mm. And perhaps borrowing some of the language from the restaurant industry, we talk about wanting to tell stories that are perhaps higher in calories um, than just those quick burn, uh, energy inefficient stories. Um, you know, you and I have talked about, um, perhaps for all of us, but certainly for a fledgling media company here in Denmark, um, the challenges to compete in the attention economy or the speed economy, and really, I think where we want to focus our attention and where I would encourage as best as we can, everybody who is joining you over, over the next 24 hours, both on screen and, and, and in the audience, to think more around the intention economy. Um, that, you know, yes, the news will report where it bleeds. It will report the fire. Journalism, like much of media, does now have a profit imperative. But profit without purpose, as a former boss of mine said, is a recipe for disaster. And profit, profit and purpose do not have to be mutually exclusive. In actual fact, where those two things can come together is really where that special rub is. That is where true impact can be felt. Ben Liebman, thank you for being inspiring. Keep up the good thank work. You. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.